This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. My name is Malini Singh. I don't know if I've met um, some of you from our last series, but I'm one of the co-chairs uh, for this uh, medical series called Medical Detectives with Dr. Jeff Tavis. I'm actually an emergency physician myself at SF General and um, just got off shift, so excuse the lateness of this starting. <laughs> In any case, um, so I'm also the medical director at the General and I'm also an assistant clinical professor here at the UCSF School of Medicine. And we started off this series because we had recognized there's quite a bit of interest among the lay public about having a little bit of an insight into what we do. And so we put together this series, and what you'll notice is that it's a series of physicians from all different disciplines who come together and talk to you all about a little bit about the mystery of their, their distinctive discipline and how they sort of use their data gathering, the deductive reasoning to come to a diagnosis, to help manage a patient, and simply just to advance their own fields. So we find it very interesting that we have very enlightened physicians who are excited about what they do, find it still intriguing after many years of doing it, and want to share that with all of you. So that's one kind of a good reason for why this series, I think, is very interesting, because you sort of get the best, best of the lot. So without further ado, our first uh, speaker of the series is Dr. Alan Wu. And I have to look down my notes because I got a 16-page CV from him. I had to condense it into one page. So I have to look down to reference the highlights, which is impossible. Um, so Dr. Wu is actually the chief of clinical chemistry and toxicology at our hospital, SF General, and a professor of, of lab medicine at UCSF. He received his BS degree in chemistry and biology from Purdue University in Indiana. He then got a PhD in analytical <coughs> chemistry from the University of <coughs> Illinois. Um, and then he actually finished a postdoc fellowship in clinical chemistry at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. So clearly he moved to warmer climate, so good for you, it's a big plus. Um, so Dr. Wu is actually certified by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry in both clinical chemistry and toxicological chemistry. Dr. Wu is actually has a research interest in multiple areas, but he does actually have within the field of clinical chemistry at both the national and international level that include the development of biochemical markers that we use in disease processes like a heart attack or a stroke, which is especially interesting for us in the ED. He also has a long history of analytical and chemistry and clinical forensic uh, toxicology background, so much so that he's actually a co-author of the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry Lab Medicine Practice Guidelines. Um, more recently, he's developed a research and clinical program in the area of pharmacogenomics. For those of us, including myself, who didn't know what that meant, basically it's a technology that analyzes your genetic makeup and how it'll affect your response to therapy. So quote unquote, personalized therapeutics, which is very interesting and very exciting. And actually, he's focusing a lot of his interest in the pharmacokinetics behind certain classes of drugs which are inclusive of tamoxifen, warfarin, like Coumadin, anti-seizure medications like Dilantin, and something that's also important for a lot of us, lipid-lowering drugs. So that's actually very interesting that he's involving his research in that topic. He's also lectured and published widely on both a national and international level, which took up most of the 16 pages for me to get through. He also has taught and mentored at all levels of students from high school all the way to postdoc fellows, and has received a number of teaching awards from each of those groups and actually just launched, for the layman public, two paperbacks. A month ago, launched a book called Toxicology, because we don't, what you don't know can kill you. And these are stories that are based on real medical and forensic cases. I'm just gonna do a little PR for him, it's right here. This was launched about a month ago. 
And it's actually available on the Kindle, too. So good beachside reading. Um, and uh, due out in March is another one of his books, which will be called The Hidden Assassin, When Clinical Lab Tests Go Awry. So without further ado, nothing gives us more excitement to hear about the medical mysteries behind a lot of the stuff that Dr. Wu does, and he's even written about it for all of us to read about it. So let's hear from Dr. Wu, who's here to talk to us about laboratory medicine. Thank you, uh, Melanie, and uh, thank you all for uh, spending an hour with us today. So I do have two copies of the book. I'm just going to pass them around. At the end of uh, the lecture, I'm going to raffle them off. So, so I've got the names. I'm going to pick some names at random, and then you can take that home with you. I'll even sign it for you if you like. So, uh, <clears throat> But it is available on, uh, on Amazon, and uh, it's uh, something that I think you might enjoy reading. What I'm going to do today is actually talk about the real cases behind the stories that are in my book, okay? So because of privacy laws, I've had to fictionalize the characters. I've embellished them, you know, a little bit like Hollywood. You know, you can't just tell the truth. You always have to uh, make it a little bit more sexy or a little bit more intriguing. Um, that's not going to be tonight. Tonight you're going to see the real cases. And then if you buy the book and you like the stories, you can, you can think about what, uh, what really happened. So, you know, I am um, not one of these uh, great physicians. I'm not a physician. I'm a laboratory person. And people don't really know a lot about what we do. Uh, so I'm going to show you just a couple of slides of what we do and introduce that with this, uh, this little story here. Um, I'm in this bar, and I see this attractive woman. And uh, so um, I ask, uh, well, what do you do for a living? Well, uh, so me, I do drug testing in a lab, okay? And then the, the woman goes, oh, so are you some kind of narc? And he goes, no, 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 I help patients who have been poisoned or overdosed. And then she goes, oh, excuse me, I have to powder my nose. Will you please excuse me? So, you know, we don't do these things to, to try to pick up women. It just, uh, <laughs> it sort of works the opposite way. So a lot of what I'm doing today, not just for you, but for other people, is to promote what we do in the laboratory why things that we do are important, not just for medical diagnoses and helping doctors like Dr. Singh, but, uh, but there are things that I think that you need to know about because they can affect your daily life. And you need to be asking sometimes some of these questions. <clears throat> so this is the book that is available on Kindle. You see my website uh, there as well. Um, and then this is the book that uh, um, is still in writing. I'm almost finished with it, uh, so I have two editions. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is tell you stories from both of these books, and you'll know which book it is because the cover will be on the, uh, on the book itself, on the, uh, on the stories itself. So I'm going to start off with a, uh, a case that all of you know about and have all seen on TV, but maybe you don't know the behind the scenes. <clears throat> The, the story is called Slide Toxin. <clears throat> What's wrong with this picture? Of course, you know what this is. This is the Asiana plane crash that occurred back in July. Many of the patients who came to San Francisco General, uh, I'm sure Dr. Singh ha had a lot to do with, uh, with uh, treating many of these patients. <clears throat> Does anybody see what's wrong with that picture, other than the fact that, you know, the tail is missing? Okay, well, um, it's a little subtle, but if you look on this view, you'll see that there is a ladder um, at the door of the cockpit, okay? So, you know, plane has crashed, there's going to be smoke, there's going to be fire. You have 90 seconds to get out of that plane if you have a chance of surviving. <clears throat> and if you're at the front and you can't go off the left side, you're not going to make it down the right side, okay? Down a ladder? Are you kidding? So this was one of the, the airplane chutes. Let's go back that did not deploy. Okay, so this is what uh, should have happened and did happen, except for this side, it malfunctioned. It didn't deploy. And what happened was, <clears throat> okay, so you can see that's a problem. <clears throat> Two of those evacuation chutes deployed inside the plane, and they trapped individuals underneath this, uh, this big uh, inflatable chute, you know? It's like a lifeboat in a closet, you know? It just it inflates and you're stuck behind it. <clears throat> and, and this is all what's going on when, uh, when fire is about to break out. So one of the flight attendants uh, was 
saw that there were other people that were trapped underneath the chute, took a knife, cut open the chute, inflated it, <coughs> and they were able to get out, okay? But unfortunately, one of those people who was trapped underneath the chute ended up coming to our ICU and was very sick, and was sick for a long time, had a unexplained metabolic acidosis, survived the actual injury of the crash itself, but then the question came to us through the, po the California Poison Center, could there have been another toxin that might have caused this delayed uh, toxicological reaction? <clears throat> so we were asked to look into this. What is, how do airplanes uh, shoots uh, deploy? Well, <clears throat> you just need to go back to your cars and, and you have your answer. It's the same thing that, that an airbag in an automobile um, explodes. It's an actual chemical reaction. You can see it on the, uh, on the right there. Sodium azide is ignited and, and then um, nitrogen gas quickly fills this airbag within just a few milliseconds. Now, if you can imagine that, okay, an airbag, you know, maybe 10 liters. Now we're talking about an airplane chute that might be 20 meters long and three meters thick. The amount of sodium azide present in that chute is actually quite uh, uh, alarming. <clears throat> and we know that sodium azide is very toxic. So could it be that these individuals who were trapped under the chute on whom a, the bag was broken open and they were exposed to sodium azide. That was the question that was asked of us. <clears throat> so we didn't have an assay for sodium azide, but um, we also had these, these patients that were in the ICU that needed immediate medical attention. <clears throat> and so we had to rush to try to put something together. We can give them some information to try to go on. Well, <clears throat> long story short, because I don't want to bore you with a lot of detail, there has been deaths related to sodium azide. We used that publication in developing our own assay within 24 hours of the plane crash. <clears throat> and result was of the three patients that were uh, in our ICU, we didn't see sodium azide. This was not the reason why they had a trouble. And you know, we're a little bit thankful for that because you know, we have car accidents all the time and, and airbags do malfunction. And it doesn't appear that that's going to be a major source of toxicity. And, in, and for one person who uh, was in the ICU for a long time, we never did find out what happened. We didn't know why she developed a delayed uh, metabolic acidosis. Okay, next star story. Uh, J.H. was a marginally successful pro golfer. He joins the senior PGA Tour in hopes of re re reviving his career and the accolades of being a pro golfer. Okay, so, so the stories are embellished. Okay, so there the really was no pro golfer, but uh, the rest of this is true, <laughs> or at least some of it's true. After a round in a tournament, a woman finds him attractive and gives him his keys to, to her hotel, or to, to her hotel room. You know, so he's all excited, and uh, uh, I apologize for some of the younger kids in the room here, but uh, you know, these days they know more than we do anyway. <laughs> he takes Herbal X, which is a herbal medication for for ED, okay, I won't tell you what, I think you know what ED is. And in hopes of having uh, um, <clears throat> excitement, he doubles his dose. Thinking that it's natural, herbal X is, is uh, claimed to increase libido, has been, uh, uh, the ingredients are, are listed here, lots of uh, natural ingredients, probably is very safe, right? And you wouldn't think that that would uh, cause uh, any trouble. Um, we got a hold of, uh, the, uh, the pills to look at once, uh, once something happened. <clears throat> we looked at these pills. They were from a nefarious uh, location in, in China somewhere that uh, when we did a Google search, you know, Google Maps search of the address, it was the middle of a lake. So clearly fictitious uh, address. And, and we see this. <laughs> and the end result of the medication that we, uh, we looked at uh, was that it was not a natural compound that it was, in fact, a remnant, uh, what we call designer drugs, of true ED medications, uh, Vialis and Sudanafil. Um, um, and you can see here that the, uh, the chemical structures are similar to the real drug that requires FDA approval. What these people did is they, they manufactured the drug to, to make it a little bit different, sold it under the name of an herbal medication, and, and, uh, and off you go. And so obviously it does work. 
What happened to the golfer? He dies of a heart attack during, during uh, uh, intercourse. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, a story from uh, another, from my next book here, uh, entitled uh, Tree Trunks Trudy, all right? So uh, it's, it's an overweight, uh, hypothyroid woman who develops uh, a deep vein thrombosis, so she's got a blood clot in her leg, and uh, undergoes uh, um, magnetic resonance imaging angiography. And so when you do that, in order for the radiologist to really see what they're looking for is they inject a dye. And it used to be that they would add a radio-labeled dye, but uh, these days they use uh, gadolinium, okay? So the reason that she was called Tree Trunks Trudy is because she was uh, overweight in school and, and kids being the way they are, you know, that's what they, that's what they used to call her. <clears throat> um, just before the procedure, we do uh, a test for renal function, kidney function, called creatinine, okay? Uh, if the creatinine is high, that, that means that there may be some pre-existing kidney dysfunction and uh, giving this, uh, this uh, dye may not be such a good idea, okay? Now, because we have to do this quickly, uh, we can't wait for the sample to come to the lab and, and it takes us about an hour to get a result back. <clears throat> we offered this test sort of as a dipstick, what we call point of care device. It's, a, it's a, just a uh, little simple device, you put it in a machine and you get a result. But the good thing is that you can get a result in five minutes. And so while you're testing somebody, you can prep that person for the uh, MRI and you're not wasting valuable uh, time trying to get a lab result back, okay? Because MRI time is uh, literally uh, thousands of dollars per minute. Unfortunately, in my story, uh, a resident, a little bit overly ambitious, does the test, improper training, gets the wrong result. Gets a result that was normal when in fact it should have been higher. And what's the end result of this case? Well, so again, iodinated contrast media <coughs> has been used for interventional radiology, but the question is, is gadolinium, which is uh, one of these uh, metals down here in the uh, lanthanide series, is it thought to be safer? And the answer is that in the absence of renal disease, it is very safe. But in this case, the girl had a little bit of kidney dysfunction, <clears throat> and she develops this condition called gadolinium-induced nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. It's really kind of a, a autoimmune hardening, it's a toxic reaction to gadolinium, and what it's been described as your your uh, skin becomes really tight, really hard, um, and there, there, there comes uh, our girl, Tree, trunk, tree Trunks Trudy. <clears throat> she develops uh, nephrogenic uh, systemic fibrosis. So <clears throat> what you don't know can kill you. Missing lights. <clears throat> Hispanic maid is sexually assaulted in a hotel while at a rock and roll musician decides to have the baby, delivers a premature baby. She's a little bit uh, uh, dark in pigmentation, and because of that, um, a transcutaneous bilirubin test is canceled. Now, bilirubin is an important analyte because if you're premature, you can't process this, this pigment that is formed from hemoglobin, and it can poison your brain. And so if you have uh, this condition of hyperbilirubinemia, you need to be treated. And the best treatment is to put a child under ultraviolet light. And what that does is it helps break down the bilirubin and, and changes it into a form that can be excreted naturally. And it's all because some children are born prematurely. Now, we have this device, sorry, um, I guess I didn't bring it, that uh, where you can measure the bilirubin with just this uh, device. Uh, you put it on the skin and it reads the color through the skin. You know, baby skin are very thin but it doesn't really work very well with, for people of color, particularly Asians, because bilirubin is a little bit yellow and, and, uh, and so, uh, so can Asian skin. And in this case, she was a little bit darker because she was Hispanic. Bottom line is that the test wasn't done. And what should have been done was a puncture, blood, sent to my lab and tested in the normal way. Well, that got overlooked too because they just assumed that the transcutaneous bilirubin was going to be done and the regular bilirubin didn't get done 
and the child got sent home and developed this condition known as um, <clears throat> uh, connectorus. Connectorus leads to irreversible brain damage. You can see the concentrations here of when uh, that can occur, and in this unfortunate story, uh, the, the baby dies. What you don't know can kill you. Spice of this life, okay, so a 36-year-old female actress is preparing for a part. Uh, she, her agent tries to relax her. She's a little bit uptight because she's uh, auditioning for this role. And so the agent gives her these cookies that are laced with synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, she eats the cookies, becomes a little bit uh, hallucinogenic and a little bit wild. And so she calls her husband on the cell phone and says, you know, you need to come home right away. I, I really don't feel well. I feel like I, I want to jump out the window. Okay, this is all a true story here. <clears throat> husband rushes home, um, puts her in bed, and while he's in the bathroom, just for a minute, and they live on the third floor of an apartment building, she flies out the window. Now, she survives her fall. She's at the general for a week, but does eventually die of her internal injuries. <clears throat> um, drug screen is done in my laboratory. It's negative for marijuana. So a synthetic cannabinoid is a compound that is structurally different from the naturally occurring marijuana that's found in, in, in weed. <clears throat> this is sold as spice. It, there's a number of different names. Actually, spice is, uh, is no longer on the market because the FDA has removed it from the market, saying that it was dangerous. So instead, there are now second and third generation synthetic cannabinoids that are available. So it's difficult to keep track of what's out there. I send my fellows out there to buy stuff all the time, you know, and they're probably on some type of uh, uh, DEA warning lists. <laughs> this is the history of, of synthetic cannabinoids. It was actually developed by a chemist at Clemson University who was attempting to try to find a, a, a compound that, that it mimics marijuana in the sense that it, it can relieve pain and nausea and could be very useful therapeutically for cancer patients and pain, patients with pain without the hallucinogenic effects. So we have different uh, cannabinoid receptors, one might uh, stimulate the other at the expense of the second one. Unfortunately, what he ended up discovering was compounds that were more hallucinogenic than the actual compounds found in marijuana plants. And the, the uh, chemists uh, that are out there figured this out, started selling this, and this is what got this particular uh, woman in trouble. Okay? The compounds are actually named uh, after the scientist, JHW18, his John W. Huffman compound number 18. These are the chemical structures of the classical cannabinoids on the left, and you can see they're very different from the ones that he synthesized, as well as the newer ones that are out there that are being abused today. <clears throat> so JWH72 was identified in the blood of the woman who jumped out the window um, and died, and the agent who spiced her cookies with uh, marijuana is currently um, uh, up for uh, involuntary manslaughter. Okay, next story. So this is um, a poster from POP 2010, which is a rave, basically a disguised rave party that takes place every year at the Cow Palace. But in 2010, it was a little bit different. This, this one went deadly. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a news broadcast of what happened that night less than four years ago. Now to that huge rave at the Cow Palace that sent 11 people to the hospital. Tonight, five of them are still in critical condition, including one who's in a coma. We're also learning more tonight about the young man who died, reportedly from taking tainted drugs. KTVU's Amber Lee, live tonight at one hospital that is treating some of those patients. Amber? Frank, we're at SF General, where 23-year-old Anthony Mata died and two others remain hospitalized here following Saturday night's rave. Tonight, Anthony's family told us they want those responsible prosecuted. We're under the technician at Pierce Toyota. 
Marta's aunt, Marie Ariano, clutched his high school graduation photo, telling us the family is in shock. We love them and we miss them to <laughs> What's With anything, we just want it back. Anthony lived here in Santa Clara with his aunt and grandmother. They told us he worked at a Toyota dealership in Milpitas as a technician and aspired to be a mechanic. They describe him as outgoing and say he loved his family above everything else. Okay, so there were actually 11 patients who got sick. They were sent to different hospitals, uh, including San Francisco General, as well as here, as well as Seton Medical Center. Um, three of them were um, at SFGH that were the most critically ill. And the question that came up, as you saw from the video, that uh, what were these kids uh, taking drugs that had been tainted with some adulterant that had caused this, uh, this effect? Because uh, MDMA ecstasy by itself shouldn't have caused this uh, rash of uh, severe illnesses. And so we were called in to try to figure out what was in these pills. The police came, they were giving these pills away in an attempt to try to hook these kids onto the drug. And, uh, and uh, all throughout the weekend they were asking us, okay, what is it, what is it? And we had to sort of back off the, uh, the reporters as well. Well, long story short, it turns out that none of those pills that we captured, the names are listed here, um, <clears throat> XZ and VT light, were not contaminated with any adulterants. But what we did find was that the concentration were quite a bit higher than what was expected um, in usual pills. And so, uh, for example, the uh, bottom one, uh, the one that uh, the person died, the MDMA concentration was 270 milligrams when a typical ecstasy dose that's sold in the black market is between 80 and 120. So this was almost two and a half times or three times the, lethal, the uh, normal dose. And if you give anything at, at excess concentrations, uh, things that might have been safe at a regular concentration end up becoming quite dangerous. <clears throat> so this was a situation where there was uh, uh, somebody who was thinking that, well, if good is good, then more is better. Okay, here's uh, my next case. This is uh, one that uh, came to the general. There was a, uh, a chemist who works in a rug factory. This is important because when you're making rugs, you use these uh, dyes that uh, create the color. These are dyes that are made out of nitrogen compounds. <clears throat> uh, he was playing soccer one day and, and collapsed on the field and sent to the general. He's, he's uh, significantly cyanotic. So what that means is that he's not getting blood to his extremities. His fingernails are, are blue. His, his uh, uh, color is a little bit uh, uh, un desaturated. And so we do a, a blood gas analysis. And what we can do is uh, determine what is the degree that our oxygen is saturated, our, our hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. And normally we'd like to be somewhere between 95 and 100 percent. This particular individual <clears throat> has a value of 74. So he has what we call a met hemoglobinemia. The, ox the iron in his hemoglobin has oxidized from the plus two to the plus three state, and that makes it no longer capable of binding oxygen that we need in order to respire, in order for our tissues to work. <clears throat> so a toxicology analysis was done in my lab to determine, okay, why did he have this condition? Is it a genetic disease? And we ruled that out by doing some basic studies. Or was, it, was he exposed to some toxin that might have caused him to desaturate his hemoglobin? Now, we know that nitrites can do this. We looked for nitrites, it wasn't there. What did we find? This is the technique that we use to, uh, to make these kinds of measurements. It's a machine called mass spectrometry. And what we find, what found was this compound called amino nitrotyaline, okay? And it is a common aniline type pigment that is used in, uh, in making rugs. So that seemed pretty reasonable, okay? He works in a rug factory. Maybe he's exposed to these kind of chemicals, got a little bit of sloppy, wasn't wearing gloves, and, and, and there it goes. But the Poison Center sent an investigator to the house, to the company, because it became an occupational health issue. If he got sick by this, maybe other workers are getting exposed, and we need to 
do some type of, uh, of analysis. And we come to find that, in fact, there is no manufacturing of, of rugs. It's just a, a warehouse that distributes them, that the colorants are made overseas. And so there was no occupational exposure. What's going on here? Well, we did some additional um, research. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the third compound um, on the left is, or the compound furthest on the left is? Okay, that's trinitrotylene, also known as TNT. So the amino nitrotylene is actually a breakdown product of TNT. So all kinds of bells and whistles got off then. Is this guy making a bomb? Should we contact Homeland Security? Should we be concerned that, uh, you know, we have uncovered uh, a terrorist in our own hospital? Okay, so none of this actually happened. <laughs> we did find nitrotylene, um, but we did not find TNT, and, and that's just part of my story. <laughs> but I got all you guys, didn't I? <laughs> Explosive blood. I hope you, you read that story. <clears throat> no snack for you. A 30-year-old moderately obese male with a history of infantile autism, pica, you know what pica is? This is when you put things in your mouth and, and you chew on it. Thank you. Is admitted to a, uh, it lives in a, in a home um, and is, uh, and dies a couple of days, uh, 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 I'm sorry, he's admitted to a, a group home uh, two days before his death. He is found unresponsive uh, in a bathtub. <clears throat> Um, at the time, uh, he uh, was, uh, before brought him into the hospital, was semi-conscious, has VTAC, uh, the, the EMS were not able to obtain uh, a pulse. <clears throat> they shocked him. Uh, he remained in asystole, and uh, ultimately he dies within a couple of hours of, of presentation. On the day of his death, he had been al let alone in an enclosed courtyard of the facility where he was suffering from pica, but just picking up things and eating them. <clears throat> Autopsy was done. They found two significant things. Number one, that there was a thrombi in his pulmonary artery, and the cause of death was listed as a pulmonary embolism. That happens. Um, a blood clot breaks off in the leg, goes to the, to the lungs, and, and this is a very serious uh, medical condition. It's a natural cause of death. On the other hand, Looking at the stomach contents, the pathologist saw greenish tan fluid, fragments of string bean, vegetable-like material, dark green plants, flat green flecks of vegetable-like material. Could this have anything to do with his death? Well, I got called in. By the way, so I'm in every one of these stories, <laughs> but I'm not the hero. I'm not the, uh, the guy who... Uh, who causes, sometimes uh, it's my lab that causes harm, sometimes we're just the innocent bystander. So autopsy findings, they, they went to a botanist and they said these are the things that, were, that the, the kid was eating. And of course, all these plants were available in that courtyard. Which of these plants is most toxic? Or if any of these? Well, poinsettia is actually not toxic. That's, a, that's, that's actually a more of a, a urban myth uh, rumor. Actually, the, the Japanese U uh, is the most toxic. <laughs> and so the medical examiner uh, actually c concluded that there was no pathologic evidence to suggest that that was the cause and ruled pulmonary embolism. But there were other pathologists who were hired to say, hey, you know, pulmonary embolism doesn't occur that often in, in a young guy. Um, <clears throat> the uh, clot uh, didn't quite look right on, on uh, gross uh, microscopy. Um, he uh, might have been in some type of generalized state of uh, hypercoagulability. This is the California Poison Control Center toxic rating for these plants. And actually the rhododendron and the Japanese yew are amongst the most dangerous uh, compounds. Poinsettias itself is, is only just very minor. <clears throat> and maybe you knew as a kid, you know, n never eat the berries of a Japanese yew. Well, actually, the leaves are also very uh, toxic. Um, you can see the lethal dose there at the middle uh, slide. <clears throat> and in fact, we take advantage of this 
uh, Taxol, which is a chemotherapeutic, is actually was first derived from uh, the um, <clears throat> compound the, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Japanese U. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the compound down there, but it's also res responsible for cardio cardiac toxicity. <clears throat> and it turns out, and I don't know who would have done this study, but chickens are really vulnerable. Uh, I, I should say horses are very vulnerable. They have the lowest LD50 in order to, to uh, have toxicity, and, and we humans are somewhere in the middle. We can tolerate a little bit more, and, and actually chickens can, can eat all the Japanese you that they want. <laughs> and thank goodness for that, right? So we challenged the, uh, this, this case that occurred in Rhode Island, the medical examiner's office, and uh, <coughs> cited this report. You know, the, the courts love to have previously published reports to go on. And if you have that, you can say, oh, see, our case mimics this. And this had already been described as a cause of death for unintentional plant poisonings from developmentally disabled adults, such as the case uh, in, in our case. But uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> this was one of the ones where, uh, where we lost. The verdict of the civil case, facility found not guilty. But they did remove all of the toxic plants from the area, and, and the garden is a lot safer now than it was. So we did accomplish something. Hospital daycare, okay. <clears throat> so there's a condition known as Munchausen syndrome. It's, it's a condition where someone causes harm to themselves in order that for them to, to get medical attention. Or it's just a psychiatric disease to say, you know, look at me, I need help. Now, there is a, another condition known as um, <clears throat> Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And that's when a parent causes harm to an unsuspecting or, uh, or a child who uh, who is uh, totally innocent <clears throat> by falsifying records and, and, and doing bad things so that they could, they could be uh, given hospitalized care. Uh, they're not trying to kill them, they're just trying to get them out of the house by poisoning them. So there was a case, this was not my case, <clears throat> but a case that was published well known in the literature where a child was, uh, was taken away from a mother because of what appeared to be poisoning by ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is a toxic alcohol. This mother was poisoning the child, but not to the point where the child was, uh, was killed. The, the, in this case, the Missouri Division of Family Services took custody of the child, and during a supervised visit, the mother fed the, bottle, the baby a, a, a bottle, <coughs> and the child immediately became lethargic muscle spasms, <clears throat> and uh, they did an investigation of the bottle and they found ethylene glycol and they suspected that she was poisoning him. So she was put in jail and the child was, uh, was, was uh, put into foster care. But then <clears throat> several uh, um, weeks later there was a, a uh, I'm sorry, there, there was, so the woman while I was in prison had conjugal visits by her husband. And she gets pregnant and has another child while in prison. This, this is all a um, true story. <clears throat> and what happened was that uh, uh, the, the child, the second child, exhibited the exact same symptoms as the first child, except that now the mother wasn't around the poisoner. So maybe the child wasn't poisoned in the first place. And maybe the mother didn't have Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So the original samples were sent to uh, a lab. This is the original chromatograms. Uh, EG stands for ethylene glycol. What we're looking for are peaks, and these peaks have to line up. And, and, and the standard for ethylene glycol did not line up for the standard of propionic acid. In fact, it was later determined that this child and the sister had a metabolic inborn error of metabolism, and that's why she caused, uh, that's why the, the patient continuously got sick and it was not linked to the, uh, to the mother. And so the mother was exonerated, she was sent home from prison. Now the reason I bring this case up is because we had a very similar case. We had a, a, a mother who was bringing a, and a child on repeated visits for the very same symptoms. And we thought, okay, let's just be 100% sure that this is not a inborn error metabolism 
we have better techniques than we had back in 1992. And we did the testing, and we found, in this case, that it was methanol, methanol poisoning, similar to what you see with ethylene glycol poisoning. But was this a true positive, or was this another false positive, and, and perhaps we were incriminating the wrong person again? <clears throat> so this is the, the mass spec data that confirms the retention times. We were pretty confident. We also had a, uh, uh, other avenues that suggested that this was, in fact, true methanol poisoning. This is the, uh, the toxicologist at the time uh, who was helping me with this case. Um, and the important thing that we wanted to, to make sure was that uh, we wanted to not be incarcerated ourselves. <laughs> the story actually goes a lot deeper. She ended up, uh, she was uh, taking a class, so this is true Munchausen syndrome by proxy. She was taking a toxicology class and learning about toxic alcohols. And then three weeks later, she was poisoning her own kid. Like this class here. What's that? Well, um, <laughs> I hope none of you are getting ideas. <laughs> Next story is called Fatal Dedication. <clears throat> so this is the story of this woman by the name of Lisa. Uh, she uh, gave all of her money to this, uh, this um, <clears throat> Church of Scientology. And so I'm going to show you a video. This was uh, highlighted on, on one of the TV programs. Of that pressure. On the night of November 18, 1995, it appears that the pressure may have become too much. Lisa was taken to a Clearwater hospital after a minor traffic accident. Why was she taken to the hospital? She was taken to the hospital uh, by uh, par paramedics who came to the scene, uh, and she was taken because she had taken her clothes off and was walking down the street. According to hospital records we obtained from her family, Lisa told EMS workers at the scene she needed to talk and that she took her clothes off to make people think she was crazy. Okay, so this is a story where this woman who had given her life savings to join this church and now was having second thoughts and was thinking, gee, you know, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I want to get out. And so she tried to get out and at the same time became sick. And she was in the care of the, of the facility and was taken to a hospital, bypassing another hospital that was closer because the, the uh, ED doctors there were not members of the church. A little bit suspicious, okay? She, uh, she ends up dying in the facility. Autopsy was, was conducted, and these are the, the findings. So um, the principal finding was that there was a, um, a um, hematoma on the left thigh, and that there was a, another um, um, pulmonary embolus that, that was found in the, in the pulmonary artery, which, again, died of natural causes of a pulmonary um, emboli. <clears throat> this is the uh, autopsy photo, it's not too bad, um, <clears throat> of her leg with the, with the bruise. <clears throat> now, this would have been fine. Nobody would have ever thought of anything else except that this was a high profile case. This was a woman who was trying to leave the Church of Scientology. <clears throat> and the autopsy lab data had some very had one very unusual abnormality, and it's listed in red here. Uh, she had a, a blood urea nitrogen content, actually a vitreous humor urea nitrogen content that was 15 times abnormal. And now normally when we see that in blood, we think of things like uh, dehydration or perhaps renal disease or perhaps uh, um, something called uh, pre-renal azotemia that sometimes can be caused by heart failure. <clears throat> They were saying, aha, the church killed the, killed the woman by starving her, depriving her of fluids, and, and there's the evidence. Well, so I was brought in to actually um, defend the Church of Scientology, okay? I'm not a Scientologist, you know, and I don't necessarily believe in what they believe in, but I do believe in scientific truth, wherever side it might fall. And I, and I believe that, uh, that the other side was trying to, to damage the reputation unnecessarily, and damaging uh, this, uh, this particular woman's uh, uh, history. It was all over the, the internet, all over the, uh, the news. It was, uh, it was quite horrendous for the family, as you can imagine. <clears throat> so there is no published um, uh, connection between dehydration and, and pulmonary emboli, so she didn't 
they knew that the, she had an emboli, but was it because was it because they were not giving her water? And the answer is you can dehydrate yourself all you want, and there's no evidence that that should that should happen. <clears throat> and in fact, we looked at uh, uh, literature studies to see that can blood urea not, or can urea nitrogen be uh, increased with uh, storage, with uh, instability, with breakdown of proteins to produce this uh, this metabolite? And the answer is at least in, uh, in um, <clears throat> some uh, studies, uh, the answer in, in, in canines, the answer is yes, that you could see that. And, and the testing was done many years after the autopsy, so there was a lot of question about the validity of the laboratory tests. We know as a laboratory scientist that the results are only as good as the specimen that we have. <clears throat> and there were other experts' opinions. Uh, you might know this guy, Michael Bodden, who is a uh, uh, forensic uh, pathologist in New York City. We said, no, I think that this was an accidental cause of death. <clears throat> so did a number of different studies to try to determine that, uh, that it was, in fact, uh, a contaminant, perhaps, or perhaps it was, uh, again, a, a breakdown product. And in the end, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the trial uh, was ended up exonerating the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the church. Now, there's a little bit of a sidebar that I didn't show. The medical examiner at the time had um, been uh, sort of cheated out of property that the church bought at, at her house or in her neighborhood and devalued. And, and so she ended up uh, being accused of having some type of personal vendetta against the church. And as a result of this highly profiled case, uh, the governor of Florida, which was at that time Jeb Bush, actually uh, forced her resignation as a result of this case, because she kind of went overboard in making these outlandish conclusions that were not uh, validated by scientific fact. What actually killed her? What was the, the pulmonary emboli. Okay, but there's no explanation for that, other than natural death. Well, so she, in that video, she was in a traffic accident, she takes off her clothes, is running naked, and, and that bruise on her thigh was, was the blood clot. And then that blood went up to the, to the lungs, and she died. That's, that's our best explanation. That's the most obvious explanation. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Singh mentioned uh, something about um, um, <clears throat> pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics is a new science where we do genetic analysis to try to determine genetic predisposition against uh, adverse events with, uh, with therapeutics. <clears throat> and so here's a situation where there was this uh, woman who was developed uh, atrial fibrillation and was put on, on warfarin. <clears throat> when, uh, when she questions the uh, doctor about uh, the appropriateness of the dose, um, <clears throat> the doctor says, you know, trust me. It turns out that um, medical mistakes is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Follow behind cancer and, and cardiovascular disease. And most of these are related to medications. This is a situation where we have a dangerous medication that can cause harm in a, in a minority of patients, and that we now have the tools to be able to identify those who are going to be at greatest risk. And this is what pharmacogenomics is all about. And what it means is that some of us are slow metabolizers, and some of us are fast metabolizers. Uh, so if you look at this drug, amipramine, which is a antidepressant uh, drug, <clears throat> if you are in the red bar and you are a slow metabolizer, you need about a third less dose in order for it to be effective than somebody who's normal or somebody who we call wild type. And then if you are in the uh, yellow and you are a hyper metabolizer, then you need more drug because it's breaking down too fast. It's the people that are slow metabolizers that we worry the most because the normal dose that's given to somebody who is a slow metabolizer can, in, in fact, be toxic. So in, in the story of a fib about a fib, I'm going to cut to the chase here, <clears throat> the, uh, the woman has a hemorrhagic stroke because the five milligram dose that's typically given was an overdose for her, and in the end, the, the doctor had uh, a fib about a fib. Sorry, a little play on words. So it's still very controversial. The testing has not been uniformly uh, adopted, um, but ideally it's, it's, you should be tested at the time that you're first put on the dose. 
because if you're on warfarin, you should have regular INR testing and dosages adjusted accordingly. So the pharmacogenomic test does not supersede the need to do INR testing, PT-INR. It's a, it's a genetic test to look at genes that affect the metabolism and the pharmacodynamics of, of the drug. And other drugs? The, 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 the other drugs are also involved, yes. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, I'm on warfarin. I took it, uh, I was tested every two days for about a week or so. And then I, I'm now on a stable and I take, I'm tested every six weeks. What is your dosage? Uh, I take uh, five milligram one day and two and a half milligram one day. Okay, so that's a little bit on the low side, but somewhat typical. Um, <clears throat> my mother's on warfarin, and uh, she requires one and a half milligrams to maintain a stable INR. If she had been given five milligrams from the get-go, she might not be here today. Okay, this is my last case. It's called the vague. Uh, I'm sorry, you first. Prospectively, let's say you're going to be put on mepo, whatever. Is there a way to actually do a test to see if you're a slower uh, uh, metabolite before you take the drug? Yes. Yes. But uh, it hasn't been uh, universally adopted yet at UCSF or any other place, quite frankly. When do you think that the, the warfarin business will soon be turned over and, and they, you have drugs instead of. So, for those you didn't hear, um, when are we going to get rid of warfarin? And the answer is that we actually are already in that process. There are now other oral anticoagulants that can be given that uh, don't require, are a little bit safer, and, and don't have this pharmacogenomic um, Im implication. But, but they are still on patent and they're quite a bit more expensive. My advice, many of you may be on warfarin. If you're stable and you do regular PTINRs, you're fine. It's really the people who just get started, the original dose, so let me go back here. I think I hit a nerve here. <clears throat> More than 7% of outpatients suffer a major hemorrhagic event within the first month of putting, being put on warfarin. And that's because it's sometimes difficult to titrate the best dose to maintain a stable INR. So this is a case report. Um, over here is the INR values. You want to be between two and three. This person had values at least up to five, which could be toxic to that person. Dosages were adjusted, which was the bottom figure, and then boom, it went too low. And now that patient is subject to uh, thrombosis. So this trial and error stuff is, is really kind of nonsense. We should be doing a better job on that. Yeah. I'm sorry, so INR is, stands for the International Normalized Ratio. It is the degree of anticoagulation. So you're on a blood thinner because you've had a stroke or you've had a heart attack. We want to prevent another stroke or heart attack from happening. Strokes are caused by blood clots. So by thinning out the blood, it, we do, it uh, increases the, the time it takes for your blood to coagulate. So in the lab, what we do is we take your blood, we add a chemical and we count the seconds it takes for your blood to clot. If you're on warfarin, the number of seconds increases by twofold, by threefold. And that's the objective, is to prevent clotting. Now, that means that if you get hurt, you cut your finger, you get bruised easily, that's the downside of having, being on blood thinners. Or more uh, dramatically, you can have a cerebral head, uh, head bleed. Yeah. When you have a surgery, like a knee replacement or something, and they give you warfarin, you know, for the first two weeks or something, um, do they test you to see if you can tolerate it, or, or is that just coming on in a lab test of your metabolism? Or? Yeah, so this is still very controversial. We're, we're not to the point where we routinely do warfarin testing, plus it's expensive, plus it takes, uh, you know, a little bit extra effort. But what they do do is this uh, INR testing. So that is something that will continue to happen. You need to have your blood tested regularly for INR and your dose adjusted accordingly. Even for long other medications? So if you change your medication, then even more so you need to be routinely monitored because that can affect the levels of your drug. Certain drugs inhibit the metabolism of your uh, other drugs. Other drugs potentiate that metabolism. So. And even just eating a different diet, having more green vegetables can affect your INR. Because the, the, out on TV, there's a guy taking a, another medication 
instead of warfarin. And it sounds like the bee's knees, you know? Is it the bee's knees? And he said, no, you don't need testing anymore. Yeah, so some of these next generation oral anticoagulants, which have only been around for the last couple of years, dibigatran is, is one of them, um, that this should, a lot of these problems should go away. But it is also quite a bit more expensive. Yeah. Sorry. I eat a lot of green vegetables. Is that, I should not be worried, right? Well, you're not on a blood thinner, right? You have nothing to worry about. Okay, my last case. This is um, called the vacationing rapist. So let me start with a video. The headlines called him the preppy fugitive. After eight years on the run, Alex Kelly had come home. He still seemed just an all-American teenager, a wealthy kid, championship wrestler, an honor student who flashed a smile and in an interview with Turning Point denied the charge was true. I believe the system's gonna work, and I'm back here to fight for the truth. But a number of women say the truth is that Alex Kelly is a rapist. Okay, so this is the chronology. He was in high school. He was a big time college or high school wrestler. He offers a ride to a girl he's never met before and rapes her in the back of a Jeep. This is in 1986. He's indicted, he's uh, arraigned, and instead he, uh, he uh, flees from the jurisdiction. He ends up in Europe, where he spends, spends the next eight years in Switzerland, supported by his family. That's his parents in, a, in, uh, in Switzerland. <clears throat> but finally, the cops figure out that the, the family is supporting them. They, they've been bugging their, uh, their uh, telephone lines and, and mail, and they, and they find him, they extradite him, <clears throat> and he stands trial. There were actually two trials that uh, were heard in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, one of them ended up in a hung trial, a hung jury. This is uh, the, the first trial where the uh, defense is trying to argue that the rape victim was on, high on drugs at the time of the rape. And the basis for that argument was that they retrieved um, blood spots from the Jeep where she was raped, this was, which was virginal um, uh, intercourse, and uh, 10 years later, they find traces of marijuana. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the data didn't hold up to scientific scrutiny. There wasn't the usual mass spec confirmation procedure, and uh, so we tried to argue that the, the data should not be admissible to court. Unfortunately, it was admitted, and it ended up resulting in a hung jury. Two years later, the district attorney decides to retry the case, <clears throat> but this time the defense finds additional evidence that wasn't tested uh, two years prior. This time they had the, the, uh, the victim's uh, undergarments, which was also bloody, and they also examined it for drugs, <clears throat> also finding um, marijuana, but this time they do the mass spec analysis that's useful for confirming the result, so it was more defensible in a court of law. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the, the data for a standard for marijuana, and this is the actual data that they presented in court. So I might mention that the defense attorney was the same guy who, who got uh, Klaus von Bülow off for the murder trial of, of his, or the, not the murder, but the, he had poisoned his wife and, uh, and she was in a coma for, for many years. So a little bit nefarious. Uh, to a toxicologist, this is a, a nice chromatogram. This is a mess. <clears throat> and what we did was we took um, analytic noise and we underwent the same type of digital smoothing, the so-called svitsky golay it's a, it's a computer program that just smooths out peaks. Okay, so we took white noise subjected it to the same degree of digital smoothing, <clears throat> and we get the same thing. So this was fabricated data. This, was, this did not hold up in court, and as a result, um, the case did go to verdict. Is short-lived. Alex Kelly's retrial goes in the other direction. This time, jurors are unanimous that they did rape a 16-year-old Catholic schoolgirl on that night of February 10th in 1985. 
In sentencing, the judge throws the book at him. 20 years see in the prison, girl. with eligibility now 26 for parole years old. only after 16 years. 10 years of probation following his release, a $10,000 fine, and 200 hours of community service to be done at a rape crisis center once he is finally out of jail. I am grateful that Judge Tierney has finally sentenced Alex Kelly appropriately for what he did to me so long ago. And I hope that this sends a message out to other rape victims around the country. And that's all I have to say. Charges on so um, <clears throat> when he was uh, found guilty, he still denies it. Uh, his comment was, are you serious? I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. <clears throat> I did not do this. Why are you doing this to me? So 60, he was given 20 years, a 16-year sentence. Unfortunately, he was paroled in 2007. He's now on the street, but he has a ankle bracelet. And there was a movie made, uh, The Return of Alex Kelly. Uh, do you, any of you ever watch the show Quincy? So there's an actor there, the lab guy by the name of Rob, Robert Ito. He played the part of, uh, of me in the movie. <laughs> Now, you got to remember now, these are fabricated. This was a true story, but this is a fabrication. I was not in the movie. Um, I, I, we're past our time. I actually have one other case, which is just one slide. If it's OK, I can show it to you, if you have to leave, OK? Uh, so um, <clears throat> these are the, the stories that I've told you, again, true. I fictionalized the characters to make them a little bit more interesting and, and more true to life because I don't know the inner thoughts of these people that, that were undergoing these things while they were alive or when they were doing the things that they were doing. <clears throat> but I'm also a science fiction guy, and uh, so I always like this concept of what if. What if something happened that could have changed the course of history? And in my world, the what if is that you have a laboratory test that allows you to diagnose something at the time in history when it really wasn't available. You know, it's sort of like going back in the time and fixing something, telling Abraham Lincoln you're going to get shot, and then the world changes from then on because he didn't go to Ford Theater. Well, imagine, imagine this, <clears throat> this movie called, uh, uh, this uh, story called Bladder Control, okay? So Hubert Humphrey had undiagnosed bladder cancer when he ran for president in, presidency in 1968, and many of you, you know, remember were old enough around then. Uh, 25 years later, years after he died, scientists at Johns Hopkins retrieved um, biopsies from Mr. Humphrey that were still in their files <laughs> and re-examined his case, looking now for a genetic test called P53 that back in 1990, 1968, didn't exist, but now, 25 years later, they knew that they had evidence that, in fact, he had bladder cancer at the time that he was running for president, okay? So in history, Humphrey did not uh, distance himself from Johnson's anti-war policy until the last few weeks of the election because he knew he was going to lose. And that changed everything. It, it changed him from being really far behind in the polls to one where he almost won the election. And in fact, had he had changed his policy and distanced himself from, uh, <clears throat> from Johnson, he might have won the election. Okay? History shows that a change in just 153,000 votes out of the 73 million cast in the key four states listed there would have been enough for him to win the election. And so my story says, okay, so what if we had the technology? He knew he had bladder cancer at the time of the 1968 Democratic Convention. It's too late to find another candidate. He throws all caution to the wind and says, okay, I'm going to go by my heart. He really was a pacifist. He believed that the war was wrong. He changed his tune t two or three weeks before, the elect uh, before he actually did in history and wins the election. Everything changes, right? Humphrey's president, not Nixon. And then the story goes on, what if? <laughs> All right, one more, sorry, one more. It's not in the book, you can't buy it yet. This is called Purple Rain. So King George III of England ruled during the Revolutionary War. Centuries later, medical historians suggested that he had a disease called porphyria. Now, porphyria is a genetic disease 
that causes you to have skin lesions, causes you to have photosensitivity, you can hallucinate, you can have neurologic disease, you can have lots of that bad things that happen just because you're exposed to sunlight. Now, during the time when the colonists wanted equal representation, you know, no taxation without representation, they didn't really want war. They just wanted um, somebody in parliament to say, you know, this is not fair to the colonists. The king, against his, his uh, political advisors, because the advisors didn't want war either, he goes, damn them, you know, it's my way or the highway. If I let, these, if, if, if I let the Americans go, then, you know, next is going to be Canada, and next will be India, and all these other places. No, I'm holding st steady, we're going to have this war. What if lab tests that are available now were available in the 1700s when he lived, he was treated for porphyria, fluids, avoids the sunlight, altered his personality, he no longer became so belligerent, he became a kinder king, <laughs> settles with the colonists, there is no revolutionary war. How would the U.S. be different if we were still a colony? That's really the, the tenor of the story. Okay. All right. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking Obamacare. We'd have already had it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to give away this book. Uh, where's the other one? Does anybody have the other one? Okay. So <clears throat> give me a number from 1 to 26. 13. 13. Okay. So. Give me a number from 1 to 26. 18. Okay, so 13 is which letter of the alphabet? Okay, M. So the winner is Kathy Manchel. Is she here? Okay. And then 18, did you say? I should pick a better, better number. This is 18. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the 20. <laughs> no, I, I said it out loud. Okay, sorry. M N O P Q R. Somebody with an R's last name is uh, uh, Suzanne Rich. Suzanne? All right. So thank you very much. Um, we have Thanks. the room for questions. Yeah, you have to tell Adrian. I'm here. In our, in our daily lives, we, we are around products and eat probably produce and, you know, vegetables and, and fruits that are sprayed upon or products that emit some kind of toxic gases or fumes or what have you, how can a, just a consumer or a lay person go about figuring out what's in their blood or is, is there any kind of toxicity within the blood? Well, certainly I wouldn't go on a witch hunt just because you're eating a product and you're suspecting something. We would need to be able to link, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so the question is that uh, if you're exposed to something and you're not sure about uh, the contents and it may in fact be toxic, is there something you can do and what would you do? And my advice is to first get off that compound and see if that makes a difference uh, and see if you have independent evidence that in fact what you're consuming or being exposed to is the culprit. This, this is very difficult to do. Uh, but uh, that is one thing to do. And then if you were to somehow be re-exposed by whatever reason and those symptoms appear, then it would be time to talk to an occupational toxicologist. And we have a, such a program here at UCSF, uh, and these people are expert, and I work with them directly, and we can look at uh, blood levels, but uh, it's really a needle in a haystack. I mean, uh, more on, around the, uh, the lines of, you were talking about that, the carpet factory, you buy a rug and it, you know, has some kind of chemical. How do you? <coughs> so, uh, so the question is, uh, like in my story, explosive blood, where you, the person was exposed to dyes that were found in the rug. Um, <clears throat> anytime that you buy a new product that has some type of smell, it could be a shower curtain, it could be a lot of different things, um, and you feel like there's sensitivity of your body to it. Uh, I would recommend that just uh, leave it outside for a while, let it be exposed to the sun. The sun is a natural healer that will oxidize these chemicals, and you're probably going to be fine. But, but you're right, uh, you know, OSHA is way behind in trying to mandate toxic substances. We have a research program where we are looking at the effects of, of household chemicals and the effect on man, and one of our targets is bisphenol A. Bisphenol A can produce a uh, feminization 
uh, because it is a, uh, um, a steroid, a estrogen-like steroid. Doesn't affect uh, children or adults, but it does affect our newborn children. And so we're trying to get that banned. Yeah. Bisphenol A. So that's, you know, everything you drink, bisphenol A. It's even in your, uh, um, <clears throat> I don't have one, your receipts. If you have a thermal receipt, you know, and you go like this, you're being exposed to bisphenol A. It's not, it's not, uh, so the question is, is it smell? And the answer is no. You can't smell it. Yes? But, uh, we hear about BPA-free water bottles and things like that? Yeah, so, yes. So BPA water bottles are available. I highly recommend, especially uh, if you are, um, um, you know, of, of uh, pregnancy years. You know, again, adults, not a problem. But if you, if you want to have children, you need to stay away from that as much as you can. It's, it's nearly impossible because it's everywhere. Yes? A relationship between, um, you know, in terms of metabolism, between sheer weight and metabolism, or are they independent of each other? So if someone gains a lot of weight or loses a lot of weight, and they're on Coumadin, for example, is the metabolism related to the weight gain or loss? So the question is, uh, is metabolism related to weight gain or loss? Um, weight does play a minor effect on, on um, metabolic rate and blood concentrations. So if you're a big, heavy person, uh, the same dose as somebody who is uh, a qu half that size would be much higher in that smaller person. But uh, in terms of the therapeutic effect, and the therapeutic effect is it's going to be dependent on how much is in the blood. So the answer is yes. There is an effect of weight. Yes? Well, back to the, the two, three drugs that are now being introduced as a substitute for warfarin. What is being done with them, apart from the price? What is being done with them that makes them more effective? How do you, for instance, not have to have uh, an evaluation from, let's say, a blood test every month or so? So the question is, uh, uh, these uh, alternate uh, warfarin-like drugs, a oral anticoagulants, how are they able to avoid the need for INR testing. They operate on a different um, principle of coagulation. Coagulation is a very complex, multi-step process, which can be inhibited in many different stages of that process. And what clever um, pharmacologists have found is that we can inhibit a different cycle of that stage, and, and the effects are going to be different. Yeah? Um, there's been quite a bit of publicity recently about the difference in dosages of drugs to men and women, with most mm -hmm. testing having been done on men. With your, what you were talking about is a phar pharmacologenics testing, address that particular area? So the question is, is that uh, are there differences in how men react to certain drugs versus women? And the answer is, Yes for some, no for others. It really depends. We can't really categorize them. In terms of our testing, uh, we do try to characterize gender. And you are correct. The, the statement was that most of the drugs, when they were approved, were, were done on, on men. And the applicability of the dose for women is in question. That is absolutely true. Yeah, in the back. You were mentioning about BPA, getting back to BPA, that it's not harmful for adults and children because there's all these reports of BPA, you know, do BPA free water bottles and avoid those sorts of receipts. Yeah, so the question is, uh, I had made a comment that BPA is not effect, not really that toxic to, uh, to adults or children. Um, I, what I really meant to say is that it is less toxic. It is certainly more toxic for the newborn, for, which is where our studies are focusing. But to say that it's completely free of toxicity is, is false. Now, we are also doing something called toxicogenomics, where we're looking at genetic variances that predisposes even adults to the harmful effects of BPA. So what BPA does is it gets metabolized to a non-toxic compound that can be readily excreted. It's called a, a glucuronide. If you have a, a, a genetic defect where you cannot produce that glucuronide, then the parent compound sticks around longer. We think that's going to be a problem. Yep. So what's the one thing that you 
stay away from that the rest of us probably are like, oh yeah, we do that all the time. <laughs> so the question is, what, what do I stay away from? Uh, you know, I can't really answer that. I don't really know. I'm, I'm not a good patient. You know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that can eat anything and can do anything. But, you know, certainly the, uh, the organic uh, foods are, is, is real. I think that those things should be uh, adhered to as much as possible if you can afford the extra cost. Yeah? What's a beta blocker? What does that mean? A beta blocker is used to, uh, so the question is what is a beta blocker? It's a drug that's used to, to control rhythm to control heart rate. And if we can control that in a patient who has had a cardiac event, then they're less likely to have a cardiac event. So I might mention something about beta blockers because Malini said that we're missing the Olympics. So there's an event in the Olympics called the Nordic Combined where you do long distance cross country and then you stop and you shoot a gun. <clears throat> beta blockers are abused in those athletes because what they do is they, you know, you're breathing heavy and you're, and you're trying to control, trying to steady yourself and your heart's going boom, 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 boom. You take a beta blocker, it slows it down, and now you can shoot without having to, to do that. And so they actually test in the Olympics abuse of beta blockers amongst those athletes. Yeah? Do you test any natural uh, substances for toxins or is all your work done on synthetics? We, we do both. So the question is, do we test natural substances? So this, this herbal X drug that, uh, that my golfer was doing, that was a, a product. It was not a blood sample that we tested. It was actually the product. So the answer is yes, we do. Yeah? Our herbal substance, that sounded like an herbal substance that the person bought at a drugstore or a rainbow store or something like that. So I thought that if I buy herbal substances, that they're approved by the FDA, but it's okay for me to take them. No, no, that's not true. So, so the question is, uh, if you buy a normal medication over the counter, are you getting what you think you're getting, and is it FDA approved? And the answer is absolutely no. The FDA does not regulate herbal medications. They're actually called nutraceuticals, and, the, and it's a food product, and, and they're not subject to regulation. Now, in Europe, they are. So it's a little bit of a problem for the FDA because they, now if you make a file a complaint, if you say, oh, I took this and I got this problem, they will do an investigation and they have the power to pull the drug or the, the product from the shelves. But as I indicated in my story, what happens is these fly-by-night operations, they just change their location, put a different label on the on medication, and within two weeks, they're back in sale again. You can't control it. Yeah? Is there a good place or website to check for things like I I'm always hearing things about these mushroom things. You're supposed to take these mushroom capsules or something. And something else called trifola. But they're all supposedly a natural plant products. And how do you, or where do you go to so investigate the, them, whether they're, they're uh, are true or if they're so the question is, uh, is there a website or is there a database that we can go to to check up on a particular product to see if it's safe? And the answer is, is, is no. You know, probably uh, the best thing you do is, uh, is um, <clears throat> Google it to see if anybody has complained about it, but there's nothing scientific, no. I'm sorry to say, yeah. And then it's sort of true that there's a lot of doctors out there that we all go to, and some of them, are pretty good at knowing about these other these things. I mean, they're, they're good at knowing about prescriptive medicines, but on these non-prescriptive things, it's hidden. It's, it's a, so the question is, uh, you know, we, we have doctors who, who know pharmacology and who know FDA-approved products, but, but they're less uh, knowledgeable about herbal, herbal medications, and that's absolutely correct. And so I would really use caution in relying on an alternative medication without really doing some investigation. I mean, I'm not saying that they're all bad. Many of them are, in fact, very good, but uh, uh, they're not all that good. Um, some of them can be very bad. And I just want to echo Dr. Wu's comment about that, um, to reiterate that it's true. Also, since it's not FDA regulated, they haven't done um, studies on interactions with other medications. Mm -hmm. So you might be on prescription medications for certain medical diagnoses, and if you can take an herbal medication, there is really not a lot of data or science if it's proof to show there's any bad interactions with what you're on. And that's generally our concern. For the, in the pharmacogenomics, if someone's a slow metabolizer, that's just across the board with any medication? No. So that can vary? 
So the question is, if you're a slow metabolizer, is that across the board? The answer is that there are a family of isoenzymes in the liver, and each one is responsible for one or more of the drugs. So there's something called 2D6, 2C9, 2C19, 3A4, 3A5, and you could be a hypermetabolizer in one drug and a poor metabolizer in another, and there's just no way to predict only way to do it. Test to see if you're a slow metabolizer or a fast metabolizer. So the question is, is there just one test? Actually, there is one test, yeah. and it's called 23andMe. So you can get your entire genome genotyped. I've done that. I've done that. Okay, and then they'll tell you yeah. which genes you're hyper or hypo or, or n normal, but then you have to sort of have the wherewithal to, to interpret that data, and, and that's the reason that the FDA is, is kind of putting a lot of scrutiny to them. They're, they're saying that you know, you can't just give people genotypes without some information of what they mean. And a lot of them, we don't know what they mean. And, and without uh, a pharmacologist or, or a doctor to interpret that result, it could be actually more harm than, than good. In fact, that's a couple of my stories talk about that. Anybody else? Thank you very much.